a native Texan who's making it big, first in stand-up comedy, and then television and music, and now major motion pictures. Hi, I'm Ernie Manoose. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Jamie Foxx. Is it harder to play a living person or a fictional character? I think it's two things. I think it's harder, but it's better to play someone that somebody knows because they have a reference. Um, if you play someone that is not quite as famous or as a legend like Ray Charles, then it's kind of suspended and a few people get it. Everybody knows Ray Charles. I was in Venice, Italy, and 30% of the questions at the film festival was about Ray Charles. Berlin, Ray Charles. So that's the great part. Now the pressure is, can you get to it? And the way I got to it, I have a, a trainer. His name is Rashawn Khan, conditioning. And he took 33 pounds off of me. I'm 190 pounds usually. He took me to 157, so we could look like Ray Charles. Looked like the 40s and 50s. In the 40s and 50s, it wasn't you know there wasn't ballets, 24-hour fitness, so nobody was really you know into the buff thing. It was clothes and how it fit ele ele elegantly. And so once we got to that, it was about how do we get the impersonation to disappear? Mm -hmm. Because everybody's oh you know and th when you do Ray Charles, there's a certain thing that you think of the, the surface. But it's how he orders his food. How does he talk to his women? How does he get mad? But he internalizes it. All these different things which would be a nuance, and that's when you're watching the screen, that's when things would disappear, and you actually say, I'm not watching Jamie Foxx. Right. I'm actually watching Ray Charles. And I believe that six weeks out in the preparation of this is when I knew I had something special, when his son, Ray Jr., would go, that's my father. Or we would be on the set and I had the, the garb on, you know, the Ray Charles clothes. And his Raylette from years ago would get smitten. Look at me as if, you know, yeah. wow, that's my man, you know. So that's, that's, that's the challenge. But the great thing about meeting challenges is the after product, which is a movie. When you say that they have that moment where they say, that's my father yeah. or the woman, what does that do to you? How do you feel at that it, point? It, it, there, there was a, the writer's name is Jimmy White. Uh, who's been, you know, had the project for 15 years. And it makes you feel so good that somebody who's been that close to Ray Charles feels it. I would always say, if I make Jimmy White cry today, then I know we did a great job because he was so close to Ray. And, and Taylor Hackford, who also do, do directed uh, Devil's Advocate, Officer and the Gentleman Against All I, uh when I would get them emotional, that's when we knew that, you know, we had, you know, something special. Take me back. When was it you knew you wanted to act? Uh, growing, I, I grew up in the South, you know, in, in Dallas. You really never put into process the acting, or oh, I'm going to go act, because, you know, at that time, you didn't really know where to go. I mean, I never get watching, I think it was Zoom. <laughs> and they would say, and this today from so-and-so from Davenport, Iowa. I'd be like, where, where the hell is that? Where, is, where are all these places? But luckily, I had a grandmother that would take me around on a bus. And we would go travel. So I, I knew what Los Angeles was about. My grandmother made sure I got my classical piano, uh, you know, studied and everything. So I got a chance to at least get to close to L.A. and San Diego and uh, started with music and, and acting and everything. And then that's when I knew that by getting close to it, I knew that this is something that I could pursue and really be good at it. And then once that happened, it was just a matter of finding the right projects and taking the right steps to get to this point. Yeah. When you talk about your childhood and that, yeah. what amazes me the most about your story is the racism you faced. Yeah. And I guess a lot of us forget that it's that recent. It's still going oh, on. Oh, yeah. It's still going on right now. That's what you're looking at right now, even with the climate of, of the war and everything. Like it's, um, it's, it, it, and it's only a few people. Like my city, Terrell, Texas, was a great city to raise a child. But there was only a few people that made it kind of bad for everybody. And it was like, you know, and those were the people that would allow us, and those were the people that were the most 
you know, just not knowledgeable about things. And that was the thing that I would always stress. Like, when I went to college, there was 81 different countries in my college. I would see somebody like you say, hey, man, what's up? I think it's a white guy. He said, and, you know, you'd be from France, so I see your brother. What's happening, brother? And he'd be from Venezuela. And that's the thing that we, that's the thing that I look back now, and even to this day, the reason that we, that we think certain ways is because we've never gone anywhere. Less than 15% of Americans have a passport. When you say Venice, people think Venice Beach, but they don't know it's Venice, Italy. You, you go to Berlin or you go to, or, or you have Palestinians and Israelis in the same student center at your school talking about their lives. Or when you see people that are Arabic that yeah. aren't radical, it's, it's just because the lack of knowledge, you know. So that's, that's the thing. It's like in, in Ray's story, Ray's story touches everything. He has a hit. In R and B, he has a hit in country western. Which country western? Like, what the hell are you doing in here, man? <laughs> what this blind guy in here? But the thing that Ray was, he was the internet. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. He was music, and music connects us all over the world. A Ray Charles song here in America or in Germany, they're still moving the same way. He was the first internet con connection, and that's what you love about this man's stories because he said, "I'm blind. I can't tell what color you are. I don't know where you're from." All I can do is this. There's something inside of me that's going to give you this beautiful piece of music. Now, if we could all take a page from that, and I know it sounds cliche, but it's really necessary. Right? That's why this movie is necessary right now, yeah. because it's bringing everybody together. We, did it in, we, we, we screened it in Toronto, and there was everybody there. You look out in the audience, and you see young kids, 10, 11, 12. Then you see older people that knew, you know, raised music, black folk, white folk. Everybody came together. And that's what's great and necessary about this flick. What do you learn about your life and your experiences from looking at what he went through? When you talk about the racism yeah. that you faced, yeah. what lessons do you learn? Well, what I learned was is that you gotta, you got to go past it. But you have to maintain your integrity, and you have to celebrate what you are. It's like when, if you take yourself back a few, in the 70s and the 80s when we were watching TV, when TV was really TV, like when you watch All in the Family. Right. You dug Archie Bunker because you knew where he came from. You dug George Jefferson because you knew where he came from. And that celebration of your culture is what you enjoy. It's like I celebrate my culture because it, it makes me happy. And then when people see me celebrating my culture, it makes them happy also. It's like when you watch Seinfeld, you know, coming from a Jewish perspective or, or wherever it comes from, people uh, uh, celebrating themselves is wonderful. The bad thing about it is when they treat you bad because you celebrate your culture. And, and in Ray, here's a man who was going through life. There would be bathrooms that say whites and colors only. And we actually thought that was cool. We actually said, yeah, that's the way it should be. And when you look back on that, it seems so ignorant. And it was. But Ray said, hey, I'm going to step past that. I said, I know. And he said, I, and I'm going to blaze a trail for everybody to kind of see their way through. And so he was hitting on so many different levels. I mean, the music is how he got you. But then it was the humanitarianism underneath it that made you love him, that, that, that really put him on the icon, legendary level. Because when he says, America, you say, man, he's singing it so many different ways. It's a lot of pain in it when he's singing it. You know what I'm saying? He was giving you everything. He was, yeah, that was a song, but he was talking about his struggle in America. He was talking about how he came to say, in spite of, that's what Ray Charles is, in spite of, in spite of the fact that I lost my mother when she was 31 years old, in spite of the fact that I can't see, in spite of the fact that there's racism and gender, whatever it is out there, I'm still going to embrace life and give life back to people. So then what does that do for you? Now, how do you face life after having had this experience? It, 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 it makes you say, hey, man, I can do it. It makes you say, hey, I don't have to be afraid. And that's the thing. You know, most people that have things happen to them in their life say, I'm just, I'll just go over here and I'll just be quiet. I don't want to. It's, it's already so bad for me. But I think that it gives me power and for any other young artist, young black artist, young white artist, whatever, to go out and do something. And then after that, speak on it. You know, like I have... Uh, now saying to myself, I said, if he can do it, and I have my sight, and I have knowledge of what to do, then that means that I need to make sure every single day I try to enrich not just my life but people around me by doing what I feel is inside, you know, uh, in, in my heart in a peaceful and a and an inspiring way. And that's why I always said to this, I said, the greedy people and the, uh, and the racist people, it's only a few of them, and we keep letting them get away with right. it because I've met everybody under the sun now that 
aren't like what I grew up with at times. Why didn't that hold you back? What was well, it in your upbringing that My grandmother, that my grandmother put me in the system. I, I had dinner with this guy named Ted Hartley. Ted Hartley's very, very rich. Comes, I go to his house and it's like gates and stuff, you know, white. <laughs> Come on in, Jamie. And he sat me at the table and said, Jamie, tell me how it happened for you because I really, under, I dig you as a, as a, as a, as a kid. What, ha what happened? I said, my grandmother put me in the system. And you have to be, somebody has to put you in the system. Somebody has to have some type of caringness about you to actually say, I'm not just going to give you an education, I'm going to give you a life, a lesson about life. And she put me in the system. She said, you don't back down to anybody when it comes to intelligence, when it comes to respecting other people. So you don't, you don't, you don't do that. And once that happened, it was a matter of, 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 of me taking that what she's, what she's taught me and then do something for the good of it. Not a lot of people doing good nowadays, is it? How much, how much, how much despair on TV is it right now? And we, now we're starting to welcome it. You know, we're starting to, uh, we're starting to look at, like, like I always, like I performed for the troops. I was on the, um, uh, uh, on the aircraft carrier performing for them. And supporting them, saying, you know, support, but I want them to come home. You know, I said, I, I want you guys to come home. I don't want to. I don't want to look and read now. Now, to, down on the thing, there's a, a two more killed and four more. I want you to come home. And that's the thing. It's like my grandmother was like, hey, go out there and do good, no matter what the situation is. And when they look back on your life, they said that kid was always trying to do good and trying to inspire and look at the life half at the, as the glass half full as opposed to half empty. Yeah. You went into stand-up comedy yeah. first, your first yeah, step. Man. Did you want to be a comedian or did you want hey, to be man, an actor and this be. was a way I to go? I wanted to be. <laughs> I went to L.A. and the music wasn't happening. I had no money and I, I go to this comedy club and I go on stage and I go into a, because, you know, the Jello pudding and the Cosby and the Stolen and the Mike Tyson that way by. I went into all the different characters I could, I, could, I, was, doing Ray, I was doing Ronald Reagan at the time, too. I was one of the only brothers doing Ronald Reagan. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I, uh, oh, well. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I just wanted to be, man. You know, I wanted to get in there and just figure out w w what, what to do. And then I just, you know, we stumbled the right way. Sometimes you fall in the right direction. And then starting out with the comedy, it kind of opened things up. because I could take the music and put the comedy with the music. I never get I was doing the Brady Bunch. Singing the Brady Bunch, but I was singing it like Luther Vandross. Brady Bunch, I said Brady Bunch. And so, you know, <laughs> it was like it gave me an opportunity from that stage to do everything that I wanted to do. And then things started to open up. I mean, you know, and Living Color, which was a, 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 the greatest show in the world for a comedian to be on. And then I started looking past. I said, man, I'm just acting. You know, I, I really want to do it. And so. Uh, that was that was like the start, you know. Are you stumbling around, just falling into good luck, or is there a direction? Not anymore. We have direction, and luckily we got great friends. I mean, uh, Will Smith actually put me on with the uh, with the with the Ali mm -hmm. thing, and he stuck by me. And you don't see that a lot, you know. He said, "No, Mr. Man, I, I know that Jimmy can do it." And Michael Mann and I became friends, and then when we went to Collateral, he called me, and I had met Tom Cruise earlier doing Jerry Maguire. I read for Jerry Maguire and didn't get the part, but he remembered me, so. Now it's it's we're stepping in the right direction, and every once in a while, if there is some luck, we accept that too. Because the luck in the Ray Charles story is is beautiful. You know, Ray got a chance to view the movie before he passed. For all those people out there who don't know that, uh, he worked along with Taylor Hackford for 15 years in order to make this movie happen. And then it was a, it was it was an uh, independent film. Phil Anschutz put up 35, 40 million dollars. Taylor Hackford makes it look like it's 80 million. Yeah. And then we couldn't get it sold. No studio would touch it uh, because black biopics or biopics period, you know, not even being black, just biopics period, you know, they didn't want to deal with it. And um, I take it to Ron Meyer at Universal. You know what's crazy about that? As a kid, he used to sneak in the Palladium to see Ray Charles perform. <laughs> and he said, I got to have this movie. Yeah. And then it just took off. And so that's the type of luck that we accept. Do you think for yourself it's harder if you would come out, because you were known so well as a yeah. comedian, to convince them you can play serious when you started in, in the dramatic area? I think or it would it have been easier to just have been an actor mm -mm, who walked mm -mm. in? I think it happens <clears throat> exactly the way... Not the way we wanted it, but the way that it's played out, we, we, we enjoy that. Because I think, it, if you look at Billy Crystal, remember what Billy Crystal played when he first started? Remember what it was, his first TV gig, remember what it was? Oh, his uh, Soap. Soap, right? Yeah. I mean, where, he played, where he played the uh, flamboyant character, the alternative lifestyle character. Yeah. And, uh, but it took time to let that character run its course, and then he moved on to other things. And I think that's what happened with, 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 with me. 
it's like uh, with the ugly character, uh, Wanda, <laughs> hey, for real, now, how y'all doing? You go through that and you let that play out and you definitely have to say to yourself, I got to pay attention because I didn't want to burn out right there. And so it's a period of years. I'm 36 now, about to be 37. And I started when I was, you know, 21, you know, you know almost, almost now 16, 17 years ago. So it's been a while. Yeah. You know, so it gives you a chance to actually concentrate on it. Like when we did Any Given Sunday, that's when it was a turn. In right. Living Color was a turn. Then Any Given Sunday was a turn. Oh, working with Oliver Stone, working with Al Pacino. <laughs> and uh, to be able to work with those people, it's that's about gotta be getting that project. intimidating, too. Huh? It's got to be intimidating because here you are, the fresh guy yeah. on the set. How do you hold your own in a situation like that? How do you do it so you don't come across overdoing it? Well, this, this would happen. Al Pacino never played football before. All of a sudden, I never played football. I'm from Texas. You played football. Come on, man. We're in Texas. You know, it's Friday Night Lights, baby. It's, you know, Texas, I mean, that was everything to me. It's like my father was a coach and everything. So playing the quarterback played up into my, it played into my, to my hands a little bit better because I've been there. I said, I don't have to act. When I got the part, I went and made a tape of Willie Beeman. I was singing on the tape. My name is Willie, Willie Beeman. I, can't, I just came up with this whole thing that I would do if I was playing football. And so that's how I, uh, I cheated in a sense, you know. So by the time we got to that speech with Al, Al Pacino and we were talking about the young, you know, athlete coming up, that's really real. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't too far away from where I come from. And then you look at Ali, Bandini Brown, Muhammad Ali is a prophet. How are you going to beat God, son? Soon they come out the garage, you beat number two. I mean, that's the comedy, that's the tragedy, that's the everything in it. And then that, that leads up to collateral, which now I've had the background. I've gone to those universities. I've gone to the, to the, to the acting school of university of Oliver Stone and Michael Mann, so I was ready uh, with the Tom Cruise thing. And then I took all of the things that I've ever learned and pulled it out. Like Michael Mann says, can you play a cab driver? I said, come on, I'll do my thing. He said, but can you not do your thing? Can you be just running the mill? Can you be the reluctant hero? Can you be indecisive? And so now when you get that type of training on that level, it's the, it's the best thing in the world. And for any actor out there, uh, they'll let you know that it really comes down to the project and it comes down to the director. In the Ray uh, project, we have a great director in Taylor Hackford who you know, is just incredible and who has such vision. And then uh, by that time, I was ready. And then all of the other actors that, were, that, that surrounded me, fabulous. Ray was shot the last of those, or was it being shot at the same time? Ray was shot that? before Collateral, okay. but we didn't have a distributor. And so Collateral came out, and luckily Michael Mann said, I'm going to let Collateral go out because he thinks that Collateral would be a great springboard for the Ray movie, in which it, it all worked out. And you have to thank those, those people. It's a little bit of luck. It's a lot of people you know, and then it's a matter of, matter of being ready when, when you're called upon. Watching your acting then yeah. in those films... Which one? Do you see the evolution? Do you see yeah. what you learn from Ray that yeah. you take to Collateral? The, the Collateral thing is the most interesting to me because it was so uninteresting, meaning that it was so boring and it was just such a nerd and it was like people were like, come on, Fox. And then after, after a while, people forgot that it was Fox and turned, it was Max. That was the most uh, eventful, uninteresting thing, the most fun was any given Sunday. We were in Miami. We was with Oliver Stone. We loved to party, kick it, have a good time. It was having a great, uh, a great. Uh, it's just, just, just. I didn't even get paid for that movie. I spent my whole check on uh, partying, going out. <laughs> so I had a, I'd never get. I rented a, a, a Ferrari, a Hummer, and a Mercedes. I was just, I was. We was nuts. You know, they, they kicked me out of Miami. They took me right to the edge and said, "Get, get the out. hell out of here, <laughs> tearing up our city." But then when it came to Ray, that's the most. Eventful thing. That's when you knew that as I would walk to the set as Ray, and some of the Raylets, the real Raylets that were on the set visiting, they would become smitten, yeah, because they thought it was Ray. Or his son would say, "That's my father," and tears would well up because we were really hitting some bittersweet moments. And that's when it all comes together. You take all of the comedy, you take all of the seriousness and everything, because Ray was so dynamic. I mean, he deals with his drugs. It deals with his women, and it deals with his life in such a way that it's not just a biopic. It, it's not just, and this happens, and that happens. Taylor Hackford did such a, a wonderful job in making it a real movie with drama and everything and, and triumph and tragedy. Playing the part, you played in blind. Yeah. And when I say that, I mean you were yeah. blind for yeah. those scenes. Yeah. Why go that route? Well, you, ha I, I, you have to. 
We took the prosthetics and we put it over my eyes so I couldn't see it all. And I hyperventilated for the first two weeks. Um, it was tough, but Ray's life was tough. I mean, you got a guy who's trying to hold on to his publishing. You got a guy who's writing songs who doesn't know who he's giving the songs to. I mean, it was tough. So I had to go there in order to really make it real because now I can't cheat. Um, and then you start to really feel what he was feeling. The music sounded better to me. Really? Uh, yeah, it sounded better. It and sounded, you played? I played, you know, and I even got a chance to play with Ray Charles before he passed, you know. Yeah. And um, I understood what he was talking about. I was playing one day and I hit a wrong note and Ray goes, now why the hell would you do that? And I said, I, I don't know, he said, the, he said the notes were right underneath your fingers and he was very adamant about it. And then I started to understand that notes are right underneath our fingers in life. We just have to take time out to figure which notes to play in order to make our music. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to disrespect him by cheating. And when the, when the eyes, when the, when, the, when the eyes were closed and they were closed for 14 hours, I would even eat lunch like that. Well, all of the things that I did in this movie were necessary so that when you see it, as an audience member, you say, I don't have to worry about believing if it's Jamie Foxx doing a great impersonation. I'm watching Ray Charles. Yeah. There's all the talk already of Oscar buzz. Yeah. Do you like that or don't like oh, that? Oh, you love it. Really? Why would you, why would you, why would you hate it? I, I hear that, see, I would I hear think that, that, that you a lot. would hate it because it's setting you up. No, no, no. Yeah. I hate it a lot because it, it doesn't set you up. What it does is it brings more attention to the project. See, that's what we want. We want people to see this movie. And so if it is that buzz, then you know you're stepping in the right direction. If you're playing basketball for the Mavericks or the Rockets, you want to go to the championship, right? right? If you're playing hockey, you want to go to the Stanley Cup. If you are in this acting world, that's the most coveted thing to have is to have someone say that it's Oscar worthy. And so you accept that. And running from it or whatever, like it, it doesn't do anything. You, know, it, you, don't, you don't do the movie to try to win an Oscar. You do the movie so you can do the best that you can. But if it's Oscar buzz, it brings, like I said, nothing but more attention to what, you, to what the art is. Can you see it as a success right now without any awards, without it having opened, without box office? Can the thing be a success uh, for you? We, we, don't, we don't even want to talk like that. We want, we want it to be successful. We want it to open. But personally, to be personally, no, personally for you. Personally for me, I think that there is such a vibe and such an such a energy right now that if that would have happened, that would definitely depress me because so much has been put into it. But I think right now it's on autopilot and you can't stop it. In Toronto... Uh, the film festival, uh, Ray was a premier film. It went on sale in five minutes. It sold 2,500 tickets. So we're, we're comfortable in that sense. Uh, you never look towards awards to define you. But, like I said, if you do get to that big dance, we're definitely going to love it. And there will be a certain disappointment if you don't have it. But at the same time, you don't look to that to define you. Because I was sitting with, uh, sitting with uh, Denzel when he didn't win for Hurricane. And we talked, and I said, as a friend, I said, hey, you know, there's going to be other days. And I said, if I could create my own award, I would give you the Omar. I said, because everybody digs you and we love you, and we know that it's just a matter of time. And then it did, ha and then it did happen. Now, right. cut to, I'm in uh, Venice uh, at the film festival in, the, in, in Venice, Italy, and D calls me in the room. Hey, yo, it's D. Get down to the, to the bar right now. I'm hearing things. And now I'm talking to him, and he's just giving me advice. I said, hey, that's the same thing I told you. I said, I'm, I'm cool with it because I know that if we do, Ray, there's going to be so many things down the line that we're going to give, get opportunities to do, and right. we just accept all great things. What's the big challenge for you left to do? Oh, man, it's, hey, man, it's, it's so much, so much, so much to do. Yeah. So much to do. Yeah, so many projects. Are there things you want to do that you haven't tried yet? You've done music, you've done comedy, yeah. you've done TV, you've done feature film, both comedy and yeah. drama. What next? You just, you know, you just keep doing what, you, what, what you're doing. I think the, the, the beauty of it is, is that you do have a chance to concentrate on certain things at certain times, like the album that we're working on right now. Um, what's great about the success on this end is that when we do this, this music, it's going to be looked at differently. We had a hit song out with Kanye West and Twister called Slow Jams, which brings us into the, move, into the music now. I just signed a deal with Clive Davis and uh, my partners, uh, Brian Prescott and Marcus King. And now we're going to be able to do the type of music that we, we want to do. There was a, there's a guy by the name of, you may know this person, Paul Anka. Heard of him. Paul Anka sat me down and taught me what music was about and what life was about. And you know what he said? 
He said, life, Jamie, is on your own terms. He said, I live my life on my own terms. He said, and that's what you need to work to get to, not to have all the money in the world, not to be the biggest celebrity in the world, just to have life on your own terms. So the music that we'll be doing will be on my own terms. And, and the, the, the one single that I'm working on, and we've worked on a video, the video starts out, the girl says, do I look fat to you? And I'm like, baby, you know I love you. I didn't ask you that. Do I look fat to you? And we pan the camera when she really is fat, but she's having a baby. She rushes to the bathroom, and she's looking at herself in the bathroom, pinching where things are that shouldn't be. And I walk up behind her. We use a sample of Roberta Flack, Killing Me Softly. And we change the words, and I say, I'm still in love with your figure. I'm still amazed by your smile. Girl, I'm so proud. You're my lady. Having my baby. And you're still driving me crazy. And you still, girl, you still got it. <laughs> and that's on my own terms. That's what I want to say to the ladies. I know all of this other stuff that's out there with the, you know, hip hop, which I love too. Like, but we want to do all of these things on our own terms. And so that's how we feel. Well, Jamie Foxx, I can think of no more to say to you, but there thank you very much for talking to us. A pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Jamie Foxx. All right, baby. Order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.